Hey everybody, my name is Empra and in today's video I'm talking with Mo Falk, who is a fellow German producer and DJ. He's been releasing on Hexagon Records, on Darklight Recordings and his most recent release, Scream and Shout, even got released on Spinning Records. Super excited for this video. We talked a lot about how to be unique as an artist, how to deal with rejection from a label and how to submit your demos to a label in the first place. All right, enough talking from me. Let's cue the intro and dive right into the video. So yeah, Mofa, great to have you in this video. So I got a couple of questions for you because I'm really interested in the stuff you've done already and I think you have your fair share of experience within the industry. I mean, one of the more obvious questions would be your approach when you send a demo to a label and do you have a certain strategy? Uh, yes, there is a certain strategy, but it has shifted depending on my career path. You know, like in the beginning, I was sending very different demos from what I'm sending now, just because I have a different back catalog and you know, there's like some reputation. There's like a couple strats that people do. I think the easiest ones are be friendly, be kind, uh, send good links. Um, like don't send a broken SoundCloud link because that's really annoying. Everybody that sends me that gets blacklisted because I hate it, you know? <laughs> and I think a lot of labels will probably empathize with that. I think in general, it's about, you know, what you can give the label much more than what the label can give you and you should present it in that way if that's somehow possible. Don't go overboard like, hey, my name is 16 years old and uh, I live in, you know, Canada, whatever. <laughs> yes, my name is 16 years old. Like, no one really cares as long as the music is really good, right? That's something that will come later once they sign your music. So I think the easiest way to get people to hear your music is if they don't have to read through 20 lines of bull now for me it's more like uh, i know the people personally and they're friends of mine and you know that's not true for every label for example i've been trying to get into musical freedom or stamped and it's very difficult and i have to do the old approach of being nice and writing a very professional email but even then when i write mofak i hope or I guess that they know who I am and they will treat it in a way where it makes sense in context. The thing is, I wouldn't follow up that much because I, I see a lot, of, a lot of people do that. And my advice would be, if people don't answer your email, maybe like write back once after two weeks and then just drop it because um, in the end, if you're gonna keep pressuring the people, they'll be even less inclined to listen to the track or next time you send something, they will just immediately delete you because they were like, oh, this was the guy that was pressuring me because people don't like to be pressured, surprise, right? There's a couple things I also do. For example, I don't send demos in the middle of the night because that's when people don't want to work anymore. I don't send demos on Saturday or Sunday. I would recommend you send it, you know, Monday, Tuesday, uh, midday or something like this just so you, the people that actually work at the labels you want to be in their inbox when they are working how you send your demo I think that's the most important thing because a lot of people don't even know about this stuff like they don't even spend a second thinking about it they just send stuff and I think it's important to be very conscious about how you send it and good artwork good presentation is key in my opinion so do you, um, like when you send your track, do you also include an artwork? Because like a lot of people don't do it, I feel like. And I mean, obviously you create your own artworks for your um, sample packs and, and stuff. And so do you always create an artwork for your track? Um, yes, I, I always send it with an artwork. It isn't always necessarily my artwork because well, I'm not that good. You know, like I can, it takes me about a day to make an artwork. And if I just want to send a quick demo, you know, no point. But I do go on Instagram and there's a lot of like 3D render and like, what is it called? Uh, Future Friday, or like something like this. There's like a lot of hashtags. Octane render is a really good one where you can find a lot of very cool futuristic 3D renders. And I just take one and put it on the SoundCloud thing. It takes me like five minutes max. And the thing is, it's not plagiarism because I'm not making money off of it. You know, I'm not putting it out there pretending it's mine. I'm just using it as an artwork to like have a little bit more feeling to the track, right? If somebody opens a demo and it's like my profile picture, very big face in their face, they're like, oh, okay, right? They'll listen. But if it's like a really cool 3D render with like a crazy, I don't know, glow thing, whatever, they'll probably remember that more in combination with the track, right? And next time they listen to the track, maybe they'll remember this 
you know, picture or maybe the other way around. When we talk about this topic, um, have you been declined by a label? And if so, like what's your what's your approach? I mean, you talked about before that getting into stemmed records, for example, uh, Martin Garrix label is kind of difficult and you have to do the old fashioned way um, with just sending an email. Um, but yeah, have you been declined? And if so, what's your response? How do you deal with this uh, feeling of being declined by a label? So that's a really good question, actually. I, I do get rec declined a lot. I think just the same amount everybody else gets declined. I do get declined quite a bit and it's very frustrating and very demoralizing. And every time I send a demo and they don't like it and they're like, hey, very cool, but you know, maybe send us more stuff in the future. I'm like, oh, why? Because it's like a big hit in the heart, right? You spend maybe two, three weeks of your life putting all of your energy into that thing. And then somebody's like, oh, it's not that cool. Like, are you kidding me? How is it not that cool? Like, this is my life, you know? For me now, I think I've gotten to a point where I'm fine with it because there's a lot of like my ego as well, where it's not necessarily just the track not fitting the label or they don't liking it. You know, it's also me having to deal with rejection. And I think dealing with rejection in general is more like an ego thing and a psychology thing, much more than like, like, oh, it's a label's fault or whatever. But also I think having a lot of releases and knowing and having proven to me, especially and other people, that I can release good stuff. It's like, okay, maybe the things that are getting rejected don't matter so much in the big grand scheme of things. Whereas in the beginning where I didn't have any kind of catalog and I didn't have anything to prove for myself, you know? And then it is really difficult to have that neglect because then you're like, oh, is everything I'm doing bad? Am I even worth it? You know, you get self-doubt and you know, you just crumble into a little piece of rock and you just want to lie there for a week. So I think just being strong enough emotionally, being able to self-reflect and have that like just awareness right then I think you're good I mean I know what you what you're talking about because I don't know if it's like the same for other producers out there but I used to not send my demos to any labels because I felt like I was not good enough yet so I produced music but I didn't send it and this was one of the biggest mistakes because actually If the label is not interested, they either not gonna text you back, obviously, like we talked before, or they're gonna reply to you and be like, yeah, it's just not the right fit for the label, maybe next time, something like this. And I always had this big fear of rejection because in my head I was like, okay, when I don't send it, they don't know my name. And when I'm like good enough, I can finally send it and be the one person they were waiting for all these months and which is like ridiculous. But a lot of these labels won't remember my name probably because you just send it out and they get so many emails a day. So it really doesn't matter. But I had my fair share of rejections in the past myself. I wanted to get on Hexagon with a track and I was discussing with them, but in the end it was not 100% the right fit, but I was in contact with them and so Fede was like happy to take it. Obviously I wanted to get on Hexagon and it was not this time, but I'm like pretty sure if you just put in the work and try and rinse and repeat and just send it out there, you will probably get there. And this goes for every label, in my opinion. I totally agree. Another thing that I'm very interested in, because I've done it myself, and it's the topic of self-releasing. Like self-releasing your music without a label. I, In my opinion, I feel like a lot of people start doing this now, like a lot of fellow DJ colleagues. And in my opinion, it can kind of work in your favor. But um, I want to hear like your approach, because you have been releasing on Spinnin, on Hexagon, on Darklight Recordings, on Future House Music, on so many labels, and you decided to release one of the tracks yourself. Um, What's the story behind it and why did you release it yourself and would you consider self-releasing again? Is it something you would say was worth it in regard of um, DJ support and obviously financial aspects? Yeah, so that's a lot of questions. But I think the, the general idea behind a self-release in my uh, case was just to try something new because um, obviously I have a lot of success with label releases and stuff, but also I have a lot of non-success with label releases as well. And for me, it's always like a 50-50 gamble, even if I'm releasing with the label, if the track's going to be, you know, taken up well or bad. Like I've released on Hex Main and the tracks have been really bad or really good, you know, uh, same with any other label, right? And for me, it was like a, a realization where it's like, okay, the label is only doing so much to push my track. I will try to do that myself 
because then I don't have to give up, you know, a share of the royalties. It would be really good. And in my case, especially, I definitely underestimated how much work goes into releasing a track. And at the time, I definitely didn't put in all the work. So it didn't do that well. I didn't get that much DJ support. People still liked the track, but it just didn't reach a lot of people because of the way that I put it out. And obviously, I want to try self-releasing again in the future, just because I think now I've, you know, I've grown, I've learned a lot of stuff. I know how the industry works a little better. By no means do I know everything, but you know, just every day you learn a little bit and you grow. And with the self-release, for me, it was the same thing. It was something that I tried out. Uh, financially, didn't work out for me at all. There was almost no promo. It was it was really bad. But I think the, the key thing is, um, for me, I really liked the track and I just, you know, for me, it was okay for it not to do that well, as long as people received it well. You know, the people that received it, I wanted them to like it and that happened. Um, so that was good. But I wouldn't necessarily do it again with a track where I'm like very sure that it has to do well. Let's say I, I get big publishing, blah, blah, for this very specific vocal, you know, maybe September by Earth, Wind & Fire or something like that. And for me then it was like, okay, this track has to do really well. Then I would much more likely go to a label and be like, hey, could you do this for me? Because then they have their input, they have their entire team, they have audience backing it up, they have promo mails, they have newsletters, right? All of that stuff which I'm building now, right, which they have already built. Uh, so they have the infrastructure, they have distributors, everything. So I think, especially in the beginning, for me, it made much more sense to release on labels. And even now, where I'm still pretty much in the beginning of my career, right? Um, it makes much more sense to release with a label because they offer you so much that uh, you can only get through luck if that makes sense, if you make a self-release. So reaching a bigger audience is more likely with the label, especially when you don't have a big following yourself, because it's difficult to like spark the first algorithmic boost of your track. Uh, you know, get on the first big editorial playlist, get on the first blogs or whatever. That's very difficult. Uh, once you know that you can do this, I think self-releasing makes much more sense, but it's difficult to go from label release to self-release and not have a noticeable decline in pretty much everything, you know, attention, DJ support, everything like that. Pretty interesting take on the topic because I feel like a lot of young producers will tend to self-release in the next couple of months or years. In, in my case, if I were to make a track and I'm really proud of it um, and I really like the track and can, I don't know how to say it in English properly, but like in, in Germany you would say stand behind it. So you put it out and you really are proud of the record and you want people to listen to this piece of music that you made. In my opinion, it makes sense to self-release it because why let it rot on your hard drive, you know? Just put it out there so people can enjoy it, but it really depends on the track and at the circumstances. I, I think the, the main issue is with uh, perception from outside, like how you're perceived. If you have a lot of tracks that get like 20 views, you're not going to be perceived as very professional because your tracks don't get any traction, right? They don't have much audience there that's like backing it up. Um, but if you have like, let's say, just imagine the difference. Small producer, 20 tracks, all with about 10,000 views. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty average, no one cares. Two tracks, both 5 million each place, that's the difference, right? That guy was just a little bit more precise, let's say maybe with his marketing or with, you know, those two tracks instead of putting out such a big volume or small tracks that maybe due, due to a self-release might not do so well. I think the perception from outside is just going to be very different and both are fine. It's just that I, for me, decided I'd rather have less very good tracks than a lot of averagely doing tracks and it's not about the music it's literally just about the performance of those track in terms of streaming numbers and that stuff right a lot of people are struggling just to get the the high numbers and i've experienced this myself like i've had my fair share of label releases as of right now and i'm quite happy with that obviously my my remix i did for feta was like the, the best one in terms of streaming and dj support as you said a lot of the label put in the work to make this happen which is super great what would be your take on being unique as an artist like what what helped you to develop your own style and make the music that you're making today because like a lot of your latest releases have a similar sound and i am a big fan of it what is like your take on being unique as a music producer instead of copying what other people do regardless if it's a trend or not that's a very it's a very good question and it's a question that i ask myself a lot as well is you know what does make me unique is it you know that one sound that makes me unique is it my entire workflow is it my general idea behind music what is that thing right and i think a lot of it for me personally comes down to 
the way I've learned to make music and the way I approach my entire production and, you know, the influences and ideas I have based on, you know, 21 years of listening experience to whatever music I've been exposed to. Being unique itself isn't usually not enough. That's very important for people to understand. Just making unique music isn't gonna get you anywhere. I, th I think it's the combination of making good music that people can relate to that also has unique parts to it. I would argue that my music is very similar to Retrovision. It's uh, probably very close to some, you know, Cool and the Gang records or Leno as well with the samples and stuff like this. And for me, that's totally fine. You know, the people that say, oh, he's using too much inspiration for blah. I don't know, maybe, you know, that doesn't matter for me because I can still feel like I have my own sound getting small little pieces from everybody and making something new for me. Maybe like the last two years I've been gathering sounds and like putting something together that I really like and now I've taken that because other people have like started to do it as well, you know, have taken parts from my sound and I'm trying to like elaborate on it, like make the Mofalk sound but you know, reinvent it in a way. So I'm taking my own sound and reinventing it to something, you know, more crazy, more unique, blah, 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 whatever. It doesn't really matter. And especially now I have a track coming up in, in January. It's called I'm Back. And it's very different from what I usually make. And people still think it is a Mofalk sound. And when I when, pe when people tell me this, I'm like, why? It like has almost no Mofalk elements. The entire mix is different. Everything's different. So I don't think it's necessarily only about sound selection and samples and, you know, sound design. I think it's also about a lot of how you perceive the music and how you want to make it if that makes sense like it's very untangible but i there's a way everybody hears the music in their head when they're making it right and i think how good you are at taking what's in your head and putting it in a software i think determines how good you are with your own style sound if that makes sense yeah it's very difficult i think if people want to get their own sound like that's how how i had it for myself I didn't have my own sound. I was making all kinds of stuff that I learned in university, you know, taking small bits there. It's like, oh, I heard a track that really inspired me. Let me make a track exactly like this, you know? I really like Keanu Silva right now. Let me try to do this. And eventually I made a track called You Wild. And that, from that moment onwards, people just assumed that was my sound. So from then on, I was like, okay, maybe this is my sound, you know, let me elaborate on that sound. Let me try to do some new cool stuff with that sound. And now it has become like my signature thing. But I never intended that to happen. And I do tell this to a lot of people. It's like, don't be so focused on like making something unique and crazy and identifiable to you personally. I think it's just about making a lot of very high quality music. And eventually there's going to be something, some idea that you have, some experience, blah, I don't know, where people will be like, oh, that sounds like this guy. And then, you know, that gives you the perfect opportunity to take that and make it even better or like, you know, change it up completely. So I don't think uniqueness is only sound selection and everything. I think there's like a lot of like a big world behind being unique and, you know, finding your own sound. And I don't think it is as important as it is made out to be by most people in the industry. But that's just my opinion, like full disclaimer, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Mofag, for, you know, being here, answering the questions. I think it's very interesting, your approach to making music and sending your tracks to labels and being rejected. And I think this will probably help a lot of other producers. So thank you for taking your time. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs>